Well, welcome everybody. I'd like to take this opportunity to introduce um, ourselves today, Warwickshire County Council. We're uh, providing a bit of an insight into Make Energy Your Business. Um, the, the aim of today's session is um, really just to give a little bit of a flavour of, of what's happening. It's, it's quite turbulent times for everybody at the moment. And given everything that's going on in terms of energy, it is quite challenging times. And we did at Warwickshire County Council see a real need for businesses. And we were being asked by a range of different businesses um, for some guidance and some support. So we really thought for, for ourselves, it was really important to be at the forefront of that, to be able to provide that intel um, and we've teamed up with NFU, National Farmers Union, and also NFU Energy um, today just to give some a little bit more of a flavour of um, what's actually, um, what does the energy, what does it look like? What does it mean? What are the challenges? I'm just going to run through um, the presentation. So my name's Hardy Sandu. I should introduce myself. Um, I'm actually from the Economy and Skills team, and my title is Business Investment Growth Delivery Lead. Um, in terms of what we do at Warwickshire County Council, it's a huge team that um, we offer support and guidance for businesses in the economy and skills team. But particularly um, myself, I'm here really in terms of the delivery side to be able to support businesses with my colleague, Robert, um, is here as well. Robert, I don't know if you want to just give everybody a bit of a wave, um, but I have business advisors on the ground that are able to support businesses um, to give them that guidance and support of sort of working through the challenges at the moment, helping them grow. Um, and it's selective finance. So if they're looking at growing their businesses and then it needs for um, uh, finance needs, we're able to support those businesses. Um, we deliver a range of support. I'm going to come on to that shortly, so I'm not going to go too much detail into that. Um, I'm just going to run through today's agenda. Any questions? No. OK, so today's agenda, um, it's um, going to be focusing firstly from NFU Energy, and we're really lucky to have Rinda Singh and Joshua Robinson to talk about the current situation, the challenges that businesses are facing, as I've mentioned. Um, what does the energy cap mean for, for businesses as well? And that's really, really important on the ground. What does that actually, in terms of the practicalities, what does that mean? Um, and tips and hints, practical ways to re reduce your usage. The costs are the costs, but actually what can we do to make those interventions to reduce those costs and bring those down? And um, the importance of an energy audit. It's always wise to get an energy audit organised. Um, and what does that involve? And what can the benefits of that be as well? And that's really important. And then in terms of the future, we'll be looking at some of the renewable options as well. So thinking about what could you do in terms of your future strategy to save energy in the long term and save those costs um, and, and have a better sort of carbon footprint as well. And those those are elements that are really, really important with, within businesses and in your businesses as well. It will be followed by a little bit of information from myself about the business support and funding. Today's session is really about the agricultural sector, but actually we're doing another session um, on Thursday, which is uh, with regards to retail, leisure, um, tourism and hospitality. Um, and again, it's a very similar format um, and there are certain sort of funding packages available for that particular sector that you might be interested to, to come along to. Appreciate with some of the agricultural sector, they kind of drift into the other sectors as well. So again, if you wish to come along, please do get yourself booked onto Eventbrite um, on there. And then um, we'll be talking about um, future support as well. Um, and George Bostock from NFU, National Farmers Union, will be talking about um, some of the regional webinars that are available and some of the support mechanisms that um, are available as well uh, for, for businesses that need to, to speak to somebody um, directly. And then there'll be an opportunity just to open the floor for any Q&A. OK. If I could pass you on to Verinda, is that OK? Yeah, that's fine. I think Josh yeah. will be starting it. Um, are you going to share do the presentation? Me, do you want me to start my business support and funding? Would that be easier? Should I do my presentation? We'll do a bit of a rejig first. It's up to you. Yeah, yeah I'll start off while we're waiting for Joshua to, to come in. 
Okay. That's absolutely fine. I'm, I'm, I'm missing here. a thing. Oh, I've been here. Oh, you're here. I'm, I'm here, here already. Here. Yeah, sorry. Sammy, I've been here for a while. You. That's uh, fine. No if, uh, uh, let me stop sharing and then uh, we can get you to, to crack on with your presentation. Okay. Over to you both. Yep, so I, I suppose it's myself starting off. Um, what I'm going to cover off is I'm going to cover off where the market's been in the last 12 months. Uh, the impact of EBRS, the, the government scheme to try and get people through the winter primarily. Uh, Sorry, can also, I just, um, we haven't got our presentation shared, Josh. Are, are, you, are, we, are you gonna? I, I can share it, I've got a copy here as well. We can't hear you, Hardy. you're Sorry. on mute. Just bear me for a second and I'll share, share the presentation. Okay, is that okay? Yeah, that's fine. Perfect. Okay, so um, yeah, so just a bit of an overview. So I'll be covering off the key market conditions in the last 12 months, uh, a little bit about EBRS, which is the government scheme on getting people through winter, uh, a bit of an outlook on the market, uh, what positives are on the horizon, will prices actually ever go back down? Uh, and then I'll pass it over to V, V will be able to talk about the renewable side of things. Um, so Hardy, if you could just move it onto the next slide. Uh, so this is our offices, a uh, little bit about ourselves. We're NFU Energy. Um, effectively, we're here to, we're an agricultural energy consultancy. We're owned by the NFU. And effectively, we're here to assist with all energy requirements, really. Uh, anything from signing a new energy contract, new connections. We have the renewables team. They can come out, do energy audits. Um, they look at wider scale things, do farm visits, site visits for you. Um, and basically we provide member member benefits, um, also the wider the wider market as well. If you're a non-member, it is something we can still assist with as well. And that's a little image of our offices. We're based at Stonely Park in Kenilworth, um, same as the NFU headquarters. And um, we've got about 50 members of staff. Um, really, really nice company to work for, if I'm honest with you, but but yeah, also really, really helpful. One of our key things is we are extremely transparent. Um, so in terms of our contracts, any commissions, we're, we're very transparent on everything from the offset. So um, that's just a little bit about ourselves. If you could just move the slide on, on for me. Um, so these are the six key areas that we cover off as a business. Um, so these are a bit of our offerings. Um, I'll leave it for V to talk about compliance, consultancy, <laughs> renewables. Um, my primary one is really the contracts. Um, so um, yeah, V will probably touch back on that a little bit more detail. Um, so if you could move on one for me, please. Yeah. Yep. So uh, this is my speciality, or I like to think it is. Um, key market conditions over the last 12 months. Um, why have prices got to where they are at the moment? Um, I've just put it in six key images, really. Um, the first one in the top left, uh, that will be the IPA plant at Selinge in Kent. So around about a year ago, just over a year ago, September 2021, um, there was a major fire at, at a interconnector in Kent. And this was an export connector that sends a lot of energy into France now. But at the time, it was receiving a lot of energy from France. Uh, energy market prices historically had been about 15 pence a unit and um, with that fire taking place energy prices went instantly up by about 40 percent they were sitting at around about 27 28 pence a unit overnight and um, one of the key things everybody thought that there would be a really really quick recovery uh, the timeline on repairs was pushed back a little bit and um, by december there, there were concerns about the cost of energy going forward uh, as we got into January 2022, we've seen a little bit of a stabilisation on the price. It looked like the repairs were going to be conducted, albeit slightly later. Uh, and then we move on to slide two. Then we had um, murmurs of, of Russian troops gathering around. Sorry, I think you've gone on one. Yeah, so, um, yeah, so picture two, sorry. Uh, we had murmurs of Russian troops gathering around Ukraine. Um, instantly, the market assessed this put a bit of a risk premium on prices. So where they had gone to about 25, 26 pence at the time, instantly they went up about another 10 to 15 pence. Um, that subsequently 
but worse and it, it resulted in the invasion um from there energy security was at risk um both throughout europe and into the uk um, and energy market prices have never been the same since um we seen what was then around about 40 pence with a risk premium built in uh, all of a sudden it went to 60 pence 65 pence pretty much overnight uh, slide three um, or picture three there that was the Nord Stream lines so Nord Stream 1 Nord Stream 2 they are two of the main cable lines that go from Russia into Germany at the time they were supplying about 40 percent of all the energy used in Germany as well as being a really really good hobby in getting energy around Europe um, with the war and with the with the sanctions that then took place off the back of that and um, those pipelines were slowly reduced uh, they went from 100 percent capacity down to 60 percent down to 40 percent then russia claimed that they needed maintenance so they took them offline for a while and um, all of these just added further premiums into the market at the same time that that happened um, over in France, um, France a really big nuclear generator of energy and they have about 52 nuclear plants in France and um, France announced that 26 of their plants were being taken offline at pretty much the same time and um, that had a really really bad impact on the cost of energy because whilst we didn't have the energy coming through from Russia also Europe wasn't able to to generate its own energy at the same time um, that again just put more premiums onto price a genuine conversation started about this shortage of energy for the up and coming winter and that was as far back as june um picture five that would be a dam in norway uh, the norwegian continental shelf as it's known so at the time that we were having these problems with russia and france um, norway looked at their own energy security first so with the drought that we had through the summer um hydro reserves were naturally lower than what we would have expected them to be at that time of year. Norway at the time made the decision that they would look after their country first before sending LNG out over into Europe. Um, LNG liquefied natural gas uh, comes via a cargo ship and it is the alternative to Russian gas at the moment. Um, after all of those things happened, um, LNG, as I've said, became the new norm. Um, almost a year to the date that we had the fire in Kent, um, there was another major fire at an interconnector in Texas, a place called Freeport. That was also an LNG plant, which had 70% of all of their LNG was bound for Europe. So again, it had a really big impact. It stopped energy in its tracks going into Europe. And we started to see energy market prices around about August. They were exceeding a pound a kilowatt hour. Um, so they were almost nine and nine times higher than what they were a year prior. Um, we started to see the Russian price cap. So Europe were meeting together, uh, EU were meeting, trying to find ways of minimizing the impact. Um, Germany themselves that were really, really large sort of, they depended on Russian gas really heavily. What they had started to do then is they've started to build their own LNG plant. Um, so it's a floating plant where they can store liquefied natural gas uh, because of the reliance on on pipelines in the past they had never had an alternative method of storing it and um, so so now that's an alternative in recent months we've started to see the prices come down a little bit um Hardeep, if you could move on to the next slide so um yeah so in recent months prices have started to come down slightly um the government have also also introduced the energy bill relief scheme um, now, this is a government support package. The way that people in the market generally see it, it's just a way of tiding people over for the winter. Um, the support is expected to last six months. Um, it was introduced by government on the 8th of September. Um, those in government at the time, they didn't release much information on it. And with the subsequent changing of government, um, it became a bit of a grey area. But what they'd done initially, they said that everybody that had taken out a contract from the 1st of December 2021, which is when they deemed that the energy crisis, um, that they would be covered um, with some level of support from the government. And that, and that would cover whether you're in a contract or whether you're not in a contract. The support package runs from the 1st of October um, 2022 to the 31st of March 2023. So for that six month window, Dependent on the costs that you paid for your energy, you would receive some level of support from the government. 
Um, what they outlined to the markets is that they would cap the wholesale cost of energy at 21.1 pence per kilowatt hour if you're in a contract. If you're not in a contract, they would give you an upper price cap um, of 34 and a half pence per kilowatt hour off the out of contract price, but that wouldn't result in the same discount. Um, so what the suppliers are now working on, and this should have began on the 1st of October, but with the subsequent delays, they're still working on it. They're working on applying a bill credit to the bills. Um, it is likely to be the November round of bills before people will see what that discount is and how it works for them. Um, from our workings out um, and on government comparisons as well, um, we would expect DBRS to reduce, reduce bills by approximately 40% over that six month window if you're in a contract. If you've chosen not to renew your contract or you've totally forgotten and you're out of contract, you will probably see about a 20% saving on the out of contract prices. Um, government are really keen on getting everybody into a contract. And if it's a choice that you wait for winter to pass, uh, you wouldn't receive the same level um, of, of cover under the EBRS scheme. Um, it does apply to all tariffs, as I've mentioned there, um, and it's the wholesale cost of the energy that is capped. So the wholesale cost of energy does make up about 40% of the bill. Other areas, including um, suppliers' profits, third party charges, those are not being looked at by the government at all. Um, there are some exclusions. So businesses that are using gas or electricity to store power, or if you're selling back to the grid, um, places they've given examples, places like power stations, pumped hydro, grid level battery storage. If you're using energy to make money, then in short, you wouldn't receive the same level of support from the government. It is a broad application. They've not gone into any detail, um, but they have said that as part of the government website, they've outlined it on numerous occasions. Um, there is also the genuine concern about people that are not connected to mains gas. Again, with the subsequent changing of government, they outlined that there would still be support offered, um, but they've not gone into any detail on what that support looks like. So we are still waiting for answers on that. And we generally publish blogs on our website as we get updates. Uh, we try and keep it as up to date as possible. Um, so if you can move on to the next slide, please, Hardy. Yep, so um, what we've included here, uh, this is just a graph on whether or not you would be eligible for the EBRS. And um, this is more for if people do want to come back to it, have a look through it. Um, it will just give you a little bit of guidance, a bit of assistance, what type of level of um, cover you would receive as well. So it just asks a couple of key, key questions. When did you renew your contracts? Um, if that was before the 1st of December, then there would be no support under EBRS because it's expected uh, or the government have, have put it out there that you should really have taken a contract at around about maybe 20 pence a unit. So you wouldn't be eligible for support under that scenario. If that contract was taken out after the 1st of December, then there's a little guide there which will show you what level of support you would receive depending on what type of contract that you've got there. Um, so if you could move on to the next slide, please. OK, so um, next one there is how a supplier is actually calculating the discount. Now, for all of the hours I've spent on this, it's still not clear. <laughs> it, it's really, really difficult to work out. Um, we've spoken with a number of suppliers. Um, EDF, uh, as one of the big six suppliers, have told me directly they've practically given up on trying to work it out. Um, they have said that the 21.1 pence per kilowatt hour, they will just apply that as the whole set price. So for customers that are with EDF, you may see a different level of discount to if you're with somebody else. Um, British Gas is the largest supplier in the UK. Again, massive grey areas there. They've just said that they will suspend bills for September. Um, so your October bill wouldn't actually in, wouldn't actually include any discount. You wouldn't receive a bill in October, but you would receive a double discount in November. So yeah, every supplier is doing it very, very differently. Uh, what the government are doing, the government are releasing 10 days after the energy is purchased. Um, you can see the graph towards the bottom. 10 days after energy is purchased, they then tell the market what the supplier would have paid for it. Um, off the back of that, and you can see the two columns on the end. I know it's probably 
not the most detailed on the picture, uh, but you can see the two end columns on the electricity side. Um, the third column in, so if you could just hover over that one for me, Adi, uh, reference wholesale price. <clears throat> um, so it just says under electricity and the reference wholesale price. So the reference wholesale price is what the government determined that the supplier paid for the energy at that point. Um, so you can see there if, sorry, I'm getting really close to the screen here, <laughs> but you can see that they paid about 54 pence per kilowatt hour. Um, and this was for the month of August. By the end of the month, you can see how much energy had gone up. They were paying about 76 pence per kilowatt hour. And that was in the space of a month. Um, government level of support there was capping the price. Uh, it's just the next column across, Hardy. so just one from the end. Um, you can see the government have said it's 21.1 pence per unit. Uh, and then the column on the very end would show the level of discount that you would receive under EBRS. Now, like I said, it's really important to remember that this is just one element of the bill. So the discounted price is not the full discount that you will see on the bills. Um, but it is still a very, very grey area and it's it's constantly progressing. Um, we would expect to have a lot more clarity on it once people start receiving their first bills and we can make a little bit more sense of it. Um, so just on to the next slide for me, please. Um, I think this is the key question that everybody really wants to know the answer to. Um, simple question, will prices ever come back down? Um, I've put there the first thing is nobody knows for definite for every situation that we've seen over the last 12 months, we didn't see the next one coming, and I don't think anybody did. Uh, in terms of positives on the market, um, the first thing, um, French, French nuclear fleet, which is those 52 nuclear generators, um, they are expecting to reboot them in February 2023. Uh, what we've heard already, four of those that they're expecting to reboot have already been pushed back. Um, so as to whether that does happen or not, it's very, very difficult to say. You would expect that some of them will go back online, but whether all of them will be, it, it's far too difficult to say. Uh, Nord Stream 1 and Nord Stream 2, you've probably seen the news reports last month about um, attacks on the Nord Stream gas lines. It, it subsequently turned out that there was no lasting damage. Those lines were tested. And whilst they're not pumping any energy into Europe at the moment, they are still there. Um, it's also important to know recent developments. Russia have announced that they will be building a gas line into China, which it, it would show or it would it would give the, the give the idea that they are not as keen on supplying energy into Europe, regardless of what happens with the war. So it's almost like Russia are future proofing themselves, but but Europe are doing the same thing. Um, Freeport, so that's the LNG plant in Texas. We're also expected to see repairs uh, completed in February 2023. Uh, that was recent announcements that have come out in the news. Another one that's not come out on there just yet, and it has really come through in the last few days, um, Norway is saying that their hydro levels are getting back to where they would expect them to be. So obviously with winter on the horizon, uh, a wet autumn, they are saying their hydro levels are at a higher level, so they are starting to pump a bit more energy. Um, potentially EU caps on Russian gas. So EU have had a lot of meetings on capping the price of Russian oil, capping the price of Russian gas. As to whether it will really have a big impact in the market, it's hard to say because the dependency now has been removed and, and moved elsewhere. So it, it's primarily LNG and cargo ships that are bringing that energy in now. Um, so what we would expect to see um, around about February next year, if these things go to plan, we would expect to see a reduction in the prices. However, we would it, it's highly unlikely on our on our viewpoints that those prices will ever go back down to the 20 and 30 pences that that were being paid before. And um, we would probably say that the market would settle somewhere between 40 and 50 pence um, because there is going to be a new way of purchasing energy. It, it's renewables are going to come into come to the fore, really. Self generation is probably going to be the key route going forward. And this is before you even consider the impact of electric vehicles, the change in the market and the willingness to go green and, and net zero. So self-generation and, and renewables are really going to come to the fore. Come to the fore. Um, if you just move on to the next slide, and I think this is my last slide, 
So where can NFU Energy help? So we've got a contracts team here. Um, as I said at the very beginning, we are extremely transparent. Um, we launch a weekly report showing the change in the energy market week to week. Um, any key changes, any world news that might impact prices, um, we can give that advice to you very, very quickly. Um, we look at sort of fixed contracts. We run buying groups for members. So if you are a member, um, we look at doing preferential deals with suppliers where we group the combined buying power of all of our members and we, we request a beneficial price and a discounted price for buying en masse from a supplier. Uh, in addition to that, um, as I've said, we, we meet from weekly market updates. So it's my job to trawl all the news and then to work with Cornwall Insights and third party insights developments and try and keep that information up to date. So if you do check our website out, there'll be a lot of blogs on there. And then um, we've got the renewable side of things, which V will come on to now. Um, so I'll hand over to V. Thanks, Josh. Um, yeah, I'm conscious of the time, Hardy, so I will try and be succinct. Um, yeah, so Josh has just spoken to us about the energy market and it doesn't seem too positive. So I think that really does emphasise the need now. Um, in back in the past, we could it could be a direct way to reduce costs by getting a cheaper energy price. That's um, not as possible now. So we need to look at other methods of bringing down energy costs. And the other direct way of doing it is an energy efficiency audit. So Heidi, do you want to move to the next slide, please? Um, yeah, so an energy efficiency audit, we as an energy consultancy recommend to any business, the first step that you should take in an ideal world is look to mitigate inefficient energy practices on your current site to really bring down your energy consumption as low as possible. Um, there are some really big potential savings and some of the um, some of the responses from the audit, they can be very low cost, but highly rewarding in terms of the money they can save. So to give you an example, um, an energy audit on average for us can save an individual, give methods of saving from say 10 to 25%. If we go at the lowest rate and on a usage of say 100,000 kilowatts per annum, a 10% saving there would be 10,000 uh, 10, kilowatts over the year and at a unit rate of 70 pence, which is what Josh is saying they're at near now. And that's 7,000 pounds saving per annum and the cost, and it's a year on year saving and the cost of the audit itself is uh, much, much lower than that. So it's definitely something that I feel all businesses should be looking at um, because the pressure is only going to grow on this uh, space um, when carbon emissions and all these sort of pressures start to amount as well. Um, we have already seeing that for the larger organizations with ESOS, um, energy efficiency audits are very applicable in the current market and the prime way to look at bringing down costs. Um, next slide please, Hardy. Um, yes, yeah, so once you've managed to mitigate all inefficient energy practices on site or bring down energy use as low as possible, um, we advise that you sort of amplify those savings by generating your own energy. So that's where the renewable solutions come in. We've set up a new service, which is known as Renewable Energy Solutions Service. And essentially how that works is we will initially um, get, collate your data. So we'll collect a lot of data from you, your bills, your usage, what's happening on site. We'll then make an assessment, which is this service is no cost, no obligation up until the point you're going to proceed with an installation. So we'll do an assessment free of charge effectively, um, looking at what sort of technology and what um, um, what size of installation is suitable. At that point, we will then pass you through to one of our improved installers. I think we've got eight across the nation and we have got um, scope to serve the whole nation now. So we will then pass you through to the installer. They'll conduct their own survey and then send you a detailed proposal that which will give you the cost, return and investment and so on. At that point, we'll receive that back. We'll also recheck that proposal um, just to make sure that we're happy with everything that's being offered. At that point, we'll notify the individual that, um, yeah, we're happy with the quote, it's fair price and it's a suitable installation for what you've got going on at site. And then, then at that point, the decision, decision falls back on the customer on whether or not you wish to proceed with an installation. Um, I just want to emphasize that uh, solar is really popular now so um, the obviously the cost of energy has risen greatly so that's reduced the return on investment but the cost of installation um, has and the cost of the parts has decreased although it is increasing now again but it has decreased and then also their efficiency and longevity has improved and we're seeing um, similar sort of improvements in the battery space 
and along with wind turbines as well. It's been very difficult to get approval for wind turbines in England in the past. We have seen more of a relaxation or a relaxation is imminent in terms of the planning permission there with micro wind turbines. Um, and so we're getting heavily involved in that and we're, we will have a, a solution and a partner available for other technologies um, out, outside of sort of solar and battery, which are the predominant and most popular ones. Um, and the other ones that would be like micro ADs, ground source heat pumps, air source heat pumps, wind turbines, and so on. So yeah, and it does really help you reach net zero by generating your own energy. Um, and those are the sort of coming problems that businesses may face down the line. And um, next slide, please, Hardy. OK, yeah, so this also creates a, a really good opportunity. So not only can you generate your own energy, but if you're generating a surplus, you can export back to the grid. So previously, pre the crisis, we were seeing unit rates of three, four pence if you're exporting back to the grid. Recently, I've seen 18 to 21 pence, so a healthy rise there. Um, and that can also help you increase your income and revenue for um for your business and then also you've got the opportunity if you do have land to get involved with the creation and uh, generation of large uh, amounts of energy through solar farms and battery storage sites which i'll touch on in the next slide sorry okay, yeah this is just um just giving you a bit more information on the renewable energy solutions service. So not only do we um, assist with the assessment of it, we can also assist with the funding and the insuring of it via our partner uh, and sister company NFU Mutual. And, and we've also got a funding partner that can assist with the installation. Um, so it can be very attractive and we do remain involved from the start to the end and you do retain ongoing support right the way through. I think it is very important that with these installations, when the lifetime of them is sort of 20 years, that you do have that bit of security behind you and with the clout of the NFU behind you um, supporting you, I think that does um, provide a great benefit there. Next slide, please, Hadi. Yeah, so this is the large scale renewable energy solution service. So this is slightly different. This is looking at what I touched on previously is if you were interested, you had some land and you were looking to lease it to a large scale renewables developer. The sort of scales we'd be looking at minimum 40 acres for solar and battery that can be anything from one to 10 acres. However, with battery it is a bit more stringent. The criteria it does need to be close, very close to a substation. Um, otherwise, it will be ruled out as unfeasible. So that's the first thing generally in the industry, how these sort of um, these sort of projects work is a developer will encounter uh, will encounter a landowner and right from the offset, the developer will ask for exclusive rights for the project. They will then um, contact the DNO and look to get grid connections um, and what they like to hit us of all that. But the, the landowner has given up the exclusive rights of the project at the outset. So we feel that that limits their negotiation and bargaining power. So what we do is we conduct a detailed feasibility study initially, which will look at um, the cost of getting a grid connection, planning permission, flood risks, and a whole host of other obstacles that could potentially prevent or um, affect the effectivity of such a project. Once we it comes back that it's feasible, we can then um, help you secure a grid, grid connection. So we work with the very best, Road Knight Taylor, and they operate on a um, industry average of success rate of attaining grid grid connection. Their average is 85%, the industry average is only 15%. I'm sure they do pick their targets in a better manner, um, and that's one variable in that, but they also have a better working relationship with the DNO. They work through them day in, day out, and they um, have got a lot of members of staff that previously worked for DNOs. And proof of that is the fact that I've seen um, when the, you obtain grid connection costs, you can have contestable and uncontestable charges. I've seen Road Knight Taylor successfully contest the, even the uncontestable charges. So um, they are very um, well known in this space and are genuine experts. And then at the last stage, once you've got the grid connection and it is feasible, we'll put you in touch with them. Um, one of our developers and you'll have all the reports and a grid connection to back you up saying that this is going ahead and it really does strengthen your um, position to negotiate a better lease term agreement. Lease, um, an idea of how lucrative these can be, um, a 30 megawatt solar farm on a 100 acre site could return you back six to 10 million across its lifetime, which is roughly 30 to 40 years. And I think with it being such a great lifetime in the, the lease agreement, the 
the need to have somebody like NFU involved is essential. The last thing you need is having 20 years of lease payments, then they disappear, leaving your whole big solar farm on your site and a lot of um, a lot of sort of admin work to do regarding that. Um, next slide, please, Hardy. Yep, so that's just, uh, yeah, and the last, sorry, that's fine, it's just going on that I've mentioned those as success rate. And uh, yeah, the uh, the last, I think this is one of the last, uh, the electric vehicle charge points. So we are also in this space now and we offer a number of different solutions. So we can assist you with domestic, but just want to touch that if it is a domestic charge point, it can we can only assist if it's paid for through the company. So we can only assist on commercial um sales rather than those um we can also assist at the workplace where the charge point you can um have contactless payments rfid cards make a return off the charge point modify the rates and then lastly we also have a lease agreement here which is also a no cost um solution for you where you can have a rapid charge point on site we're partnered with a company called instavolt they've got the most popular public network of charge points across the nation and they're looking for sites that are near a roads motorways or tourist attractions and so on and anything along those lines they'd be very interested to discuss a lease agreement where they could potentially install rapid charge point they'd make a return from the charge point you'd make a return from the lease yep next slide Hardy. Yeah, and there's more information on our website. Also, um, Josh and I, I'm sure Hardy will be willing to provide our contact list on. We're, we're um, most welcome to any sort of inquiries as well. So, yeah, I'd be more than happy to discuss that with you. And if any, you've got any questions, we'll be here at the end as well. I think that's us done, Hardy. Thank you very much. That was really, really useful, actually. I've, I've learned absolute loads and I'm sure there'll be some questions um, shortly as well. I'm just going to run through some presentations from Warwickshire County Council. Again, if just bear with me for a moment. So in terms of the support that we're able to offer you from Warwickshire County Council um, in the economy, I'm just going to touch on the economy and skills team at uh, Warwickshire County Council. We have five teams and just to kind of give you the breadth of the, the type of support that's available, we have a Warwickshire Skills Hub. Um, and um, I think it's really, really important because people don't realise how much support goes into um, various business support programmes to help economic development uh, across the patch. And I think we're really keen in economy and skills to sort of develop that um, and prosper that high growth economy. And some of these elements um, are actually all helping us to kind of go in that right, that direction. Um, so in terms of the skills support, um, there's employment skills team that are working with businesses, providing sort of training um, that provides uh, providers and working with schools, um, ensuring that there is a strong supply of the right skilled staff and residents with, with in locally as well. And I think that's really, really important for future growth. Um, in terms of investing in Warwickshire, we have a team that's dedicated as well to those businesses that might be looking at inward investing into the region um, or going from sort of international investors that are looking at the at Warwickshire as a patch. Um, and the team are actually on hand to sort of help and drive that forward. Um, and we sort of work on various sort of priority sectors like your automotive, your creative industries and, and very many others that are listed in our council plan, um, to name a few. We also have links on a commercial property um, search as well facility. So if any of you know of any businesses or you're a business that are looking at expanding and are looking at um, a commercial site, a unit, um, uh, so what I would suggest is that you come and speak to us to, to find out if that's something that we could help you with. So there is a facility online where we can do some searches to see if there's anything suitable. In terms of business centres, we have about eight business centres across Warwickshire County Council, um, sort of um, across Nuneaton, Bidford on Avon and Rugby. Um, and some of them also include conference facilities as well. So if anyone's interested or having a meeting with a business, that's really, really important. Um, we also have a strategy and commissioning team, um, and the aim of this is really to sort of um, be responsible for seeking those financial and funding opportunities. So in terms of 
funding for Warwickshire County Council. We've been very lucky in the past for securing European funded programmes. Obviously, that's come to an end. We are looking at opportunities sort of going forward. We have um, a team that look at external funding um, to support economic development and drive that forward. Um, and some of the programmes that we support are things such as Start, Grow, scale funding um, for those businesses. And you may well have heard of some of the COVID recovery funding that some of the, your, the businesses um, that you may well be working with um, have sort of taken advantage of. Um, we also have a particular programme called Project Warwickshire, which is to support leisure, retail, hospitality and tourism sectors um, as well. And um, we also secure funds to support access to funds, uh, access to finance funds as well, just to help those business to kind of get to that next stage, take on staff and grow. So again, if you are looking at sort of um, any any of those, I would say certainly come and speak to us um, because there could be some funding streams that are available and a good opportunity for you to sort of look at if you are diversifying into, if you're in the agricultural sector and you're diversifying into another sector, um, if it's retail, not retail, or it might be retail actually, um, or it could be a glamping site, what, whatever it might be, I would suggest that you speak to us directly and we can uh, take it from there. The team, the strategy and commissioning team are really sort of focused around around um, sort of managing those funds and working on the grant provisions that are provided um, and also looking at future funds. As I mentioned, European funding is, is coming to an end, has come to an end. Um, and some of those programmes that we were delivering are actually finishing in June um, 2023. So we've got a very small window of, of those funds and the team are working very hard to look at future um, sort of shared prosperity fund and how that's going to work going forward. And the business investment growth, which is my, my team, um, we actually help and support businesses to with a front facing delivery team um, to support and offer advice to businesses. And I would say that it's, it's quite um, a unique service that's available. Um, we are particularly focusing around finance. So if there's a business that's looking at growing how to um, sort of grow to that next stage, I would certainly say come and speak to us. There might be some funding streams that are available. Um, we also deliver a range of European funded programmes, including we um, support on the innovation programme, Comity and Warwickshire Innovation. If there's a business that's looking at innovation, um, developing new products and services, and we can help you and sort of um, give you some guidance and support on that as well. Um, and we are very lucky at Warwickshire County Council that we have got some funds ourselves um, in terms of a small capital grant, um, which I'll touch on shortly as well. This is of the range of um, sort of support that is available in terms of the programmes that I've mentioned. We've got the startup programme that's delivered by Coventry and Warwickshire Chamber of Commerce, and that's to support startups and also um, new businesses um, that are developing sort of in the first sort of 12, 24 month window. We've also got a business ready programme that um, is delivered by University of Warwick. Um, and this is to, to help those high tech businesses um, evolve and, and develop and, and, and sort of go to that next stage and, and give them the guidance and support that they really need. Project Warwickshire, which I've mentioned, it's to support the tourism, leisure, hospitality um, sector. And the business and investment uh, team that I've uh, just mentioned as well offers the support for finance. So that kind of just sums up all the different sort of support mechanisms that are in place. I'm just going to run through these slides um, a little bit quicker than I was anticipating. But as you can see, there's various access to funding finance support that we deliver. Um, and as you can see, there's a range of support there. Um, and um, there's also a lot of COVID support that we have de delivered previously as well. Um, what the team actually does, the strategy and commissioning team, is have a look at what the needs are of the businesses and we shape the programmes going forward determined on the, on the needs as well. So the Warwickshire County Council Small Capital Grant um, that we deliver, um, it offers funding from 5,000 to 35,000 towards cost of capital investments. So if a business is purchasing some capital equipment, um, the minimum project spend needs to be about £12,500 plus VAT. Um, and this is really for those businesses that 
need that little bit of a support mechanism in place to take on staff to grow to that next stage and they wouldn't be able to financially afford to do it themselves so it's really just to act as that support mechanism to to help those businesses some of the businesses that we we've, we've helped previously um a new machine that you know that, that a, a business needed in a manufacturing facility um and also refurbishment um to create new facilities for more staff so that hope that just gives you an, an example. But again, I would urge you to, to come and speak to my business investment growth, uh, growth team directly. We also have a duplex fund, which are grants of up to, um, well, it's £100,000, up to £100,000 loan, and 40% of that are grant um, funded. Um, and it's supported by Coventry City Council and Warwickshire County Council and managed by an organisation called Coventry and Warwickshire Reinvestment Trust. Um, and some of the examples that businesses have, have used this fund for. So it's part uh, grant, part loan, um, refurbishment and fit out of a, a salon and resurfacing of a, a carting track. So some of you might be looking at diversifying in other areas. And again, I would urge you to, to come and speak to us so we can route you to the right provision and support. And the Warwickshire Recovery Investment Fund is a fund which has been launched by Warwickshire uh, County Council. Um, Warwickshire County Council have been very bold um, in sort of making this step and this is something that's positive that's come out of COVID I have to say and recovery um, and there's three arms to to the fund um, and this is really to help those businesses recover so there's um, a 90 million pot of funds for business and investment growth um, and these are those high growth businesses that are looking at um, sort of growing um, and it's capital spend and um, looking at purchasing equipment, growing mergers and acquisitions, so whatever it might be, again, come and speak to us. There's a smaller pot of fund, which is um, £1,000 up to 100000 and this is to help and support those smaller business, social enterprises, startups, um, and those real small businesses that really need that local support to, to grow and evolve. And then there's a property infrastructure fund, which is 40 million. Um, and this is to help those property developers that are looking at um, sort of, uh, there, there could be, for example, a, a unit um, that needs to be commercialized. We need to get the infrastructure in place, the energy, the electricity, all that infrastructure. So you can see that there's a pot of fund for various different businesses um, uh, to, to kind of support the smaller businesses. The, the larger businesses, but also the, the property and infrastructure for, for Warwickshire as well. And I suppose for, for the agricultural businesses, um, the RIF, the Warwickshire Recovery and Investment Fund, is a, a way to sort of put your growth plans into place. Um, and looking at NFU research, it's really recently revealed that um, farmers across the UK were asked about diversification, um, 1,652, and actually over one third of businesses said that um, that they would um, uh, look at a third party were already utilising land for non-farming non -farming activities. So that was quite interesting that if you're in the agricultural sector, you might be looking at diversifying into other areas such as um, it might be it could be renewables, it could be holiday accommodation. Um, so, again, what I would say if, if there are funds available from a thousand pounds to 10 million, and this is a commercial loan to support your businesses to, to kind of grow to that next stage. Um, this is an example of a business that we have supported through the, the RIF. It's a specialist residential care facility in Nuneaton, um, helping uh, sort of uh, young children from the ages of uh, six up until the ages of 18 and helping them through sort of um, a facility where they are able to secure support with um, support needs that they have. Um, and the actual forge care facility is quite unique in, in what they're actually doing. It's a residential care facility aimed at helping that target group. Um, and there's four different units that at the moment that are, are sort of are taking place. Um, but this is an, as an example to show that the fund was used to, to create that space for, for the, the young. So again, there, there are different businesses that will be using the pot of funds for different things. And again, what I would urge you to do if you have got an inquiry that you are looking at funds at the moment and looking at speaking to your bank, come and speak to us as well and we can see what how we can support you to, to sort of guide you through that. And our contact details are there. So if you have any questions, please do give, give us a call directly um, or look us up online as well.
Thank you very much. Thank you. I'm just going to pass you on to George from the NFU. Thank you, Hardy. Can you hear me? Is the microphone working? Yes, I can hear you. I'm just going to get your uh, presentation up. Yeah, well, say Harley presentation, just the one slide from me, but um, I'll be very quick and we're still finished on time. Um, there you go. So, yeah, I'm not going to say too much, um, say a huge amount of what I could cover has already been covered quite rightly by NFU Energy. Obviously, we're, we're two sides of the same coin covered by the same organisation, so I'm not going to repeat anything. But primarily, I, I just wanted to introduce myself, really. So I, I'm George Bostock. I work as the NFU County Advisor for Warwickshire. So there's two key parts to my role, um, which include liaising with stakeholders across Warwickshire, including MPs, councils and police, um, for example, making sure that they are aware of farming and, and working with them to support the industry. Um, indeed, this meeting came about from a discussion I had with Hardeep several weeks ago to discuss business support that might be available from Warwickshire County Council towards the agricultural sector. Um, the second part of my role is very much to assist NFU members um, when it to assist NFU members when issues arise. So we've got 800 plus members in Wiltshire, roughly 50,000 members um, across England and Wales as a whole. Um, but that's not to say that non-members will be ignored. And if any farmers watching this back have any issues, um, you know, my email is on the screen there. So hopefully these slides will be forwarded on into the future. Um, so feel free to contact T, whether that's about energy or anything else, um, including planning, welfare, bovine TB, literally anything that impacts farmers. Um, so the NFU is there to help. So whether you're a member or not, I'm there to support and hopefully we can get you involved. Um, so yeah, that's a brief introduction of what the NFU does. Like I say, we've got 50,000 members. We're a trade association um, lobbying local, regional, um, national and international on a host of matters. Um, as you can see there on the photo, we've already had meetings with Rishi Sunak. Um, we've had meetings with Theresa Coffey, the new Secretary of State. Just last week, I held meetings with Jeremy Wright, the MP for Kenilworth and Salvan. We've held meetings with Sakib Bhatti as well recently. And we've got meetings coming up with Nadim Sahawi, which I'm looking forward to. And it's all about making sure that those people that matter know exactly what's going on in the sector. So talking about energy at the moment, you've obviously got the Energy Bill Relief Scheme, which was discussed earlier on. Um, obviously, that's going to be coming to an end in the new year. Um, so when we've been holding these meetings with politicians, we're trying to really lobby for the fact that um, far Farming is a sector that when the when the support is streamlined, it needs to make sure it is still being supported because obviously farmers have been hit so hard through rises in feed prices, rises in fertilizer, through rises in fuel. Um, so it needs to make sure we can get the support because farmers have really hardly been hit. Um, in terms of other information you can find, you can find a whole host of information on the NFU website. Um, there's a big screenshot there of what you may find. We had a webinar last week with Mark Spencer, who was the new agricultural minister um, down in Westminster. So that was a fantastic meeting. We've got vlogs from Minette Batters. We've got vlogs from our NFU economists, really stating kind of where we are at the moment. We've got webinars with NFU Energy as well, like we just had. So there's a whole host of information available, which I really think members and non-members non can take advantage of to really try and get an idea as where the, of where the world is at the moment. Um, I also just wanted to highlight two fantastic organisations, which obviously it's OK not to be OK at the moment. There are many people that are that are struggling financially and have many worries. Um, so I wanted to highlight the um, RABI and the FCN, so the Royal Agricultural Benevolent Institution and the Farming Community Network. They are two fantastic charities that support that are there to support the agricultural sector as a whole. So you don't have to be a farmer, you just have to um, be working in the agricultural sector and they are there. So FCN, they can have someone on the farm to support you, um, to speak to you face to face on any issues that you may find. And ROBI, same again, as well as having um, kind of financial grants available for you as well, um, if you are in dire need. Um, you know, farming is a, a lonely place at times. So I think it's important to know that these people are there for you. Um, so it's been a very tough year financially through, through drought and rising costs. Um, so I think it's very important these people are uh, people are aware of these organisations and through them and in if you we are there to support all farmers in 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 Wiltshire as a whole. And I think that's really all I need to say, Hardeep. Thank you very much. That's really sort of summed up the support that is available for those businesses that may well be struggling, those agricultural businesses. Are there any questions? I'm conscious of time and um, we, we've overran. Andy. Um, hi all. Very interesting. Thank you very much. Uh, can you hear me, by the way? Yes, we here. can. Yeah. Um, Joshua um, spoke very well, um, and I've made a note to see if I could contact him. But then George has just said at the end, if it's energy related, contact him as well. So we're looking at a whole site um, sort of energy review, really, for our farm. We've got a small farm in, in Warwickshire. We are NFU members. We want a grid connection and we want to look at some solar. Where 
where do I start? It's a bit of a minefield, to be honest. I think the industry that, you know, it's been said there's a lot of sharks in the industry. I would feel safer being guided by the NFU. Um, you know, where do I start? Do I start with Joshua? Do I start with George? Do I go on the um, NFU Energy website or... Where, yeah, it's where, probably where probably one for me, that is. So, um, yeah, the first step would be an energy efficiency audit. But if you're looking to move on from that step, then um, I would definitely suggest contacting us, speaking to our team about the renewable energy solutions. And then what we'll start to do is we'll start to understand your site. So we'll understand um, whether you've got um, relevant roofs, the, the direction they're facing, your usage, your usage specifically between April to September, because that's when solar generation is going to be peak. So we'll analyze a lot of that data and then we'll put you in touch with a local improved, fully vetted installer um, who will also essentially do the same thing. We'll pass them across what we've got, but they'll come out to site, do a site survey and so on. Um, if not always a site survey, sometimes desk based now with the, the sort of drones you get are, are sufficient. Um, but yeah. then they would uh, start assessing that. And if you wanted to look to couple it with battery storage, they could look into that. Um, if you haven't got half hourly data, we might need to put in some monitors to fully understand that. Um, yeah. But if you've got half hourly data, then we can find that out pretty quickly, to be honest, with some of the mathematical modeling data. Um, so, yeah, that would be the first step to get in touch with us and we'll we'll put you through the sort of channel. If you're not looking for the audit and the, the renewable energy solution and the return on investment on solar these days, I think it's it's really essential for business to look at because um, I've seen some returns on investment that are as low as two years. So um, when you're getting a return on investment on something like that and it's going to keep you in good stead for the future. I think. Um, do I get in touch with you, Verinda, or yeah, do I, do you, I, do you I email you? Have you got have you got an email yeah, address um, down or? Yeah, I'll put it into the notes. And have you got the chat? And I'll put it into there. Got the chat. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, I'll put it but into just there to say, now. We'll be sending along all of the slides, which has got everybody's contact details as well after the session, along okay. with the recording as well. So hopefully you'll have all of the contact details. Any queries or anything, please feel free to come directly to back to me um, as well. If there's any all questions. Right, brilliant. Thanks. Thank any you. other questions? Oh, one more. That they're telling me that they're not giving permission for ground mount panels at the moment. Is that right, or it, the ground mount panel space is you has do gone. need planning permission for those? Um, yeah. So it does really depend on um, what you've got going on in your vicinity. If you've got a lot of neighbours who are going to think it's an eyesore, then um, they'll probably object to it, and that's going to cause you problems. Um, but yeah, that, that's the only thing with it, the planning permission. I have noticed relaxation though significantly um, for solar and planning. So previously when, um, say I've been working here for almost two years now, when I first started joining, getting solar in places like Wales where they had areas of natural beauty and um, green belt lands, they were not being approved. But recently we have seen areas of natural beauty get approved for solar. I think it, it, it's just essential. We need to move. We need to become sustainable yeah. as a country. Yeah. And, um, especially farming as an industry as well. Yeah. From memory, Andy, you're up in North Warwickshire, aren't you? So, Correct, George. Uh, yeah, yeah. Well, I've met I've met with North Warwickshire District Council quite recently, as well as Craig yeah. Tracy, UMP. And yeah. yeah, both have stipulated that yeah, they're very much in support now of looking for kind of the green agenda and doing that. So I think um, you wanted to go through planning permission, but I would hope if they're following their word, then they would be supportive of it. Great. Yeah, we've as, as I mentioned in the presentation as well, we've seen um, or, or it's imminent that um, wind turbines will get a relaxation on the planning as well. Recently in England, they've been very strict and stringent in terms of not allowing them, um, but we are going to see a relaxation there as well. Fabulous. Thanks. Thank you. Any more questions? No, I don't think there is. Well, thank you. I'd like to just take this opportunity to say thank you to all of our speakers today. Um, it's been really insightful for me just to learn a little bit more as well. But thank you very much for everybody's time today. And again, as I mentioned, we'll be sending the slides across with the uh, copy of the, the briefing that's uh, been recorded. And um, it would be great to get some feedback as well of, of what you thought of the session, if it's something you'd like to see sort of going forward, what your you know, future aspirations are, are on that. But yeah, if you could let us know for feedback, that'd be great. It helps us shape our future delivery uh, as well. That'd be fantastic. But I would like to just say, if you are looking at um, sort of 
going down the road of um, renewables, etc. Please do think of Warwickshire Recovery Investment Fund as well, because that's something that it could help you to finance some of those um, diversifications that you, you might be cons sort of considering as well um, right now in terms of the green agenda. So thank you very much for everybody's time. Thanks, Heidi. Thank, thank you. you. Thanks. Bye bye. Thank you. Well done.